Today we're going to be discussing uh, one of the most important aspects of using Crosslink 1040, and that's how to complete a basic individual tax return. And within that, we're going to cover a few topics, starting with, obviously, how to add a new tax return. And then once we open that return, we'll take a look at the important areas found within a tax return, kind of give a lay of the land once you're inside of a return. After that, we're going to take a look at the client data worksheet, one of the uh, primary forms we've been working with Crosslink 1040. We'll add some federal and state forms to the tax return and see how that process works. We'll select the refund disbursement method. In other words, how the taxpayer wants to get their refund. Is it a check from the IRS? Is it a bank product? If so, is it going to be a direct deposit or, or a, a regular printed check? We'll take a look at all that. After that, we're going to verify for errors. One of the most important st steps when you're wrapping up a tax return, making sure that there aren't any errors in the return, which allows you to print and transmit, which is right after uh, verifying. We'll take a look at printing and also archiving, how that works in the software. And in, in addition to that, we'll take a look at capturing signatures from the taxpayer and spouse, see how that process works. We'll learn how to queue in transmit and what exactly that means when you're working with a return. And finally, we'll wrap up with a few helpful tools to keep in mind when you're working in the return. Some things that may, that may make your life a bit easier when you're processing a tax return, so we'll make sure to cover some of those as well. All right, so with that said, what I'd like to do now is move over to the program. And what I actually have here is our login for the 2017 software for Crosslink 2017. And I'm here because I wanted to point out a couple of things. First of all, now we have this forgot password link. So if you're working with the program, and uh, you know sometimes it happens where you forget your password or maybe a new preparer that isn't used to logging in with Crosslink doesn't remember their password, well, keep in mind that now you can click on this link as long as you type in their login information you can click on this, and depending on what you've entered in the software, you could either send them an email to reset their password, or if you've captured the cell phone information for this user, you can also do that as well. In my case, I don't have my cell phone in here, and that's why it's grayed out. But I know my password, so I'll just type that in real quick. There we are. And here we are on the landing page of Crosslink 1040, the work in progress summary. Um, from here, if you want to begin a new tax return, you can create a uh, add a new return using this button right here. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll click on Select a Return or Look Up. Either one of these options takes you to the client grid. Just wanted to point out this area because this is where you would find all of the tax returns that you currently have stored in the system. If I return to the Work in Progress Summary, and to do that, by the way, you want to click on this WIP button. That takes you back to the work in progress. If I go back, I can see that I have 31 tax returns in my system at this point. But if I go to look up, nothing appears. It's all blank. And that's because um, to display all the returns that you currently have in the system, you simply want to click on this go button that we have here. Uh, if I click on that, there are my 31 tax returns. I could also use this search field that we have here to search for a particular return. And it could be a partial search, a partial entry. You don't have to enter in, in the case of my search uh, option here, I don't have to enter in the full last name or the full social. I can just do a partial entry, and it shows me all the returns that fit into that. But with that being said, let's start a brand new return. To do so, I'm going to click on the Add New button. That's also available here. The first thing that the program wants is the taxpayer social. So I can type that in. And by the way, if the taxpayer does not have a social and would like to apply for an ITIN, you can use this W7 button that appears here on the bottom left. This will open up a return with the social comprised of all nines, that all the all, uh, numbers will be nine. Um, but when you print out that social, or when you print out that return rather, the that social of all nines will appear blank in the SSN field. So please keep that in mind as well. But for now, I've entered this social, I'll click on OK, and the program will take us to the client data screen. This is where we capture all of the basic taxpayer, spouse, dependent information, and so on. 
And we're going to go through this page here in a bit. But before I do that, let's talk about some of the information, some of the options that we see here while we're in the return. So first up, we still have access. If I go all the way to the top left, we still have access to our tabs. And this allows me to jump from the 1040 program to the business program if I'm preparing corporate returns. As a matter of fact, I can have this return open and access another return here in my business side, my business package. So that's something you can do as well. You can jump from one to the other. And there's also our website tab. So if you wanted to jump directly to our website, you can access it directly through the program. You don't have to open up another window. Below that, we have the menu bar, um, which has access to a lot of the same menu items that we had before when we're outside of the return, such as database and setup. But now we have some new ones, such as return, that allows us to do some pretty important things when you're working in the return. Some examples of some options in here that you may be using frequently is, uh, let's say, delete a return. That's a pretty common you know, question. How do I delete a return once I've created it? Well, there's only one option or one uh, area you can go to to delete a tax return, and that's this option right here, delete return. Something else to keep in mind is this lock unlock option that we have in here. This uh, lock unlock allows you to essentially place the return in read only mode um, to prevent any changes being made to that tax return. And as you work with the return, when you either print or queue a return for transmission, the program will automatically place a lock in the return to prevent any further changes being made to that tax return. But if you do have to make a change, let's say you have to make an amendment of a return, that means you have to open up this return again. The return will most likely be locked automatically. But you can always come in here and flip that switch. It's essentially a toggle switch. You can click on it to lock it, and you could also click on it to unlock it. So it toggles back and forth. Now, another one that I like to mention is this reload billing option that we have here. This is when you're working with the invoice. And by the way, here's the invoice of the return. This is where you can go to take a look at, um, let me enter in a filing status so we can see it, where you can go to take a look at the fees for the tax return, any tax prep fees that you've configured into the software would populate in here. Um, and you could also modify those tax prep fees manually. And we'll take a look at that in detail here in a bit. But the reason why I'm bringing up this um, reload billing option is because in some cases, you may have some fees in here automatically calculated, but then after the return has been created, you may at some point go into your billing setup, modify those tax prep fees, maybe you know add additional fees or just modify them, and you want those new uh, you want those modifications that you've made to apply to this return that you're currently looking at, to this return that you've already created. Well, that's what the reload billing is all about. It'll basically take into into consideration any new changes that you've made to the billing setup, and it would apply them to this return that already exists. When you make any changes to the billing, that will affect all new returns. But if you have any returns that have already been created, and you need to basically kind of refresh this invoice, uh, take the billing that you've changed and plug it into the return, that's what the reload billing is about. So if you make any changes to your billing throughout the season, um, or, you know, uh, if you have an old return and you want to reflect a new billing that you set up, please keep in mind this option uh, to, to make that re-change into the tax return. Another option, another very common question is how, to create, how do I create an estimate of this tax return or an estimate of a, of a refund? Now, that option is found here as well in the return menu, this tax estimator option that we see here. So once you open, a, once you open up a return, you can click on this estimator and then enter all the information that you want to enter in to create a, you know, an accurate estimate of the refund um, um, and see right away how, how much is this taxpayer going to get when it comes to that tax refund. Now that being said, I'm going to return to the client data. That's the return, uh, that's the menu bar that we see up here and some of the most popular items within this return menu. But below that, we have the toolbar. And as you can see, the toolbar looks a bit different when you're outside the return. Now we have a whole bunch of other options available to us. Some very important options 
such as the verify button to verify for errors, the queue button to get it uh, queued up, essentially. This queue button means to get it ready to be transmitted. Um, so that's going to be an important button throughout when, you, when you're processing tax returns. Payments, if you want to make a, if you want to register a payment being made to your office, especially and specifically if the taxpayer is paying cash um, and you're not using a bank product, for example, so they have to pay their tax, you have to pay, the, the taxpayer has to pay the tax prep fees directly to your office. That means that, you know, they're paying you directly and that, that, reg that payment should be registered using this button, especially if you want to run reports and see, you know, how many of your preparers owe you money and things like that. And also important is this chat button, especially if you're new to Crosslink and when you're working with the program, if you encounter uh, any questions, if you have any uh, questions that arise when you're working with the program, you can click on this chat button and chat with a technical support rep here at Crosslink. So I definitely recommend that if you have questions down the line. Now below the menu bar, we have this black information bar that runs across the screen and it gives you some good information. It gives you the taxpayer's name, which I haven't filled out just yet. That's why it's blank at this point. It gives you the social of the taxpayer and the date in which this return was created. Now over here to the left is the attached forms pane. Uh, this is going to be your main method of moving around the return. If you need to access the 1040, you can double click and it takes you there. You'll notice that I have California already added into my uh, return here. And that's because I've configured the program to add California automatically into every return that I create. This is something that you can do as well. But I just wanted to point out that you can jump to any state forms by just double clicking on them. You can jump to any of the general forms. These forms that we see here are ones that are included in Crosslink, kind of like to help you prepare the return. These aren't transmitted to the IRS. They're just useful for the preparation of the return. So, and, and naturally you can double click on any one of these and jump to that area as well. Returning to the client data, over here to the right, we have the main page of the program, right? Any form that you double click on will display in this area. And then also down below here, this gray section that we have at the very bottom of the program, this is very important as well. If I return to the client data and kind of go through these fields here, you'll notice that the bottom will, will change and it will display any information associated with the field that I'm on. So it gives you essentially line-by-line -line help with any field that you may be on. Simply click on the fields, look down below, and it'll give you additional information about that field. So very useful if you're new to Crosslink or even new to tax preparation in general. Um, that bottom area can definitely help you out as you work your way through the return. And also, these uh, buttons that we see here, well, you can't really see them at this point, but if I click on occupation, now you can see that we have a choices button. We'll see how these buttons work as we enter information in the return, but these are going to be very useful as well as you're preparing the tax return. All right, so now that we have some of the basics of what a tax return looks like, let's actually start entering some information here. Um, I'm on the client data, which is the first screen that you see when you open up the return, and I'm, and I'm going to start entering information for this tax return. I already have the SSN in here. I'll jump over to this field, the DOB field, or if I look down below, it tells me the taxpayer's date of birth. So I'll just start typing in some info in here. And there we are. I'll enter in a name for the taxpayer, last name for the taxpayer. There is a middle initial box in there, so please be aware of that. And now we're in the occupation field. And I'll stop here just for a bit because I want to show you what this choices button is all about. Anytime you land on one of these fields that has the choices button illuminated, what that means is, is that you have a list of options, a list of choices that can be popped into this field. In the case of occupation, if I click on choices, guess what? I have a list of different occupations that can be plugged into that field. And I can just simply click on the option, click OK, and there we are. Another thing you can do, as long as that 
option is in the choices list, you can start typing in and the program will want to fill out the rest for me. So depending on you know, what letter you use, whatever the case may be, um, just start typing it in and the program will auto-fill auto the rest for you. Now I'll go, I'll keep moving forward, entering in some phone number information here, entering in a cell phone. Now this cell phone option is very important if you want to start using this send text button that we see on the top here. This allows you to click, uh, to send a text message to this taxpayer right through the software itself. It's a very easy and convenient way for you to keep in contact with the taxpayer. And one of the things you can do is, you know, you can send a text to this one taxpayer by clicking on this button when you're inside of the return. But you could also send a mass text message to multiple customers at the same time when you're outside of the tax return. So keep that in mind. If you want a, an easy way uh, to keep in contact with your taxpayers, with your customers, for a multitude of reasons, it could be for like errors, it could be for letting them know that their check is ready to be printed, or it could even be for, promo for uh, promotional purposes. If you want to mass text and let people know about extended hours for the season or some sort of uh, discount that you have going on, whatever you want to use it for, uh, we have that option. This send text button can be very useful for that. Another field that you may want to consider typing in uh, is this emailed field for the taxpayer, because this allows you to email the tax return directly to the, to the customer through the software as well, if you want to, um, if you capture their email information. So I'll enter in something in here real quick. Now, when you're using this cell, when you're using, when you want to use this send text feature, it's important to capture their cell phone information, but it's also important to mark this box, this little text message box that we see here. And if I click on this field and look down below, it says checkbox if customer agrees, agrees to receive text messages. So that's what this box is all about, to essentially make sure that you're asking the taxpayer, hey, is it okay if I send you a text message um, regarding, you know, whatever you want to say, regarding the tax return, regarding your check being printed? If they say it's okay, mark it with a box, and that, that basically sets it up in the software so that you can send a text to them. So please keep that in mind as well. And also important is the cell phone carrier, especially if you're not using TextLink Plus. TextLink Plus is this additional service that we have where we kind of set up the system for you. If you're not using TextLink Plus, which does have a cost associated with it, even though it has, you know, it has expanded features. But if you're using the free service, which is usually through a Gmail or through your own email, um, uh, domain, uh, you have to capture in the cell phone carrier if you want to send a text. So thankfully we have a list here of all of cell phone carriers within the US, so it's just a matter of selecting it from that choices button and clicking OK. And there we are. So now I'll move forward. I'll enter in the taxpayer's ID information, which is one of the new requirements that occurred last tax season, but it's carried forward to this season. I'll enter in some info right here. It was issued in 20, uh, let's say, excuse me, 14, expiration date, let's say 2018. There we are. Now, filing status, this is how you would uh, uh, select what type of return this is going to be, what, uh, what filing status this taxpayer falls into, whether or not they're singled, or if they're married filing jointly, or head of household whatever the option may be, you can use this bottom section to enter in or to select what number would be appropriate for that filing status. And then tab away. It shows for, for this return, I'm gonna choose head of household because I wanna enter in some dependents. And then here we have the address information. And the first line that we have here actually is this care of line, which is if you need to kind of address this um, if when you're mailing something and you need to address it to someone else other than the person that it's actually being mailed to, other than, you know, in my case, first and last is my taxpayer. If I need to send this uh, when it comes to the mailing to someone else, that would then give it to the taxpayer. I can enter that information there. But in most cases, you want to skip that. If that, if that doesn't apply, 
and I, and I would imagine in most cases that would not apply. It's very uncommon. You want to go to actually to the second line, and this is where you start typing in the address that you want to use for the taxpayer. There we are. Below that, we have some uh, combat information. If the taxpayer was involved in some sort of military conflict, you could uh, enter that information here. We have a list as well of all the combat zones within that happened as that have happened recently. So you can make that choice there if appropriate or if needed. Now below that, we have the bank name and the routing number and account information. This is if the taxpayer wants to do a direct deposit, all right? And again, we have a choices button available to us. And this choices button, this one is interesting because as opposed to the ones that we've seen so far, such as the occupation and the uh, cell phone carrier, this one is a what we call a dynamic database. Every time you enter in a new, uh, excuse me, a new uh, bank and a new routing number, that information is going to be saved automatically into the program. So that next time, for the next taxpayer, you'll see every single bank that you've entered previously and their specific um, routing number. Now, something I should mention about a lot of these choices buttons is that if you ever want to modify this information in here, if I have to make a correction for one of these banks or one of these routing, routing numbers, you can uh, typically access any of these choices by going to the database menu up here on the top left. This is where most of those choices buttons, all those lists, these, this is where they're found. In the case of the bank, here's my bank and routing number database. So I could always come in here and modify this information manually. Same thing with the occupation. Even though this doesn't save as a dynamic database, I can always modify it manually if I need to add someone. So like for example, here are the ones that I've added manually into my program. So you can do the same. And when it comes to adding one of these manually, I should mention as, real, as well real quick, uh, just because it kind of causes confusion sometimes. If I need to add one, if you encounter one of these sequence numbers, what it wants here is a three digit code for this new database option that you're adding. So all I have to do is type in any three-digit number, whatever I want, as long as it doesn't repeat, then click on Add, and then I'll be able to type in what exactly I'm uh, uh, the new occupation I want to create. I'll click on Save, and there we are. Now it's added into the database, and I can click it from this list. See how that's connected together? All these choices buttons, or I should say the large majority of them, are connected to this database here, so you can modify them that way. But returning to the return, I'll uh, select any one of these banks here just to have some information. And then when it comes to the account number, I'll type that in real quick. And it's going to want me to retype it in just to make sure that I've been entering it correctly, which is very important. We definitely don't want to send the refund to the wrong account. So you want to check that information. And you also want to check the routing number, especially if you have multiple banks that are the same, you see, uh, same same um, bank name, but different routing numbers depending on the branch. So please keep that in mind. Now the referral option, this is another one, another database that you can store into the system. And this is actually one that you can use to keep track of how the taxpayer heard of your business. So you can build this list of different ways that the taxpayer may have heard may have heard of your business using the database menu. The referrals are up there as well. You can add as many of these options as you need, and then later on you can run a report and see how many customers did that flyer bring to your office, or how many customers did that coupon uh, that you had uh, um, sent out to your customers. How many of those? How did that work when it came to bringing customers into your office? And that's something you can keep track of. Uh, as well. And this description, by the way, you can use this as well, especially if you had a referral. You can type in the name of the, of the person that did the referral. And again, you can run a report and see how many folks Mr. Pettis here brought over to your office and uh, reward him or her accordingly. Now below that, we have our health insurance information, how the, it, how the taxpayer has, uh, has coverage when it comes to their health insurance. 
And the easiest option is this first option that we have here. The taxpayer receives health coverage through the entire year from their employer. So marking that with an X is all you necessarily have to do to move forward. But if the taxpayer purchased their health insurance through the marketplace, we have option or letter D for that. You can simply click on this Quest button. The program is telling me that it's going to mark this letter D box with an X automatically, and it's going to take me to this ACA questionnaire. If I click on Yes, there we are. Here's the AC questionnaire where you can complete the information using that 1095A, right, to fill out, you know, when exactly did they have coverage through the marketplace? Was it for the entire year? Was it for specific months? And uh, fill out this page with all the required information. But for now, I'm actually going to just keep this one simple. I'm going to say that they had their health insurance through their employer, and I'll move down below to my dependents area. Now here, let me start entering in some dependents. When I enter in the first letter of the last name, it's going to want to fill out the rest for me. And then all I have to do is enter in some information when it comes to the age, enter in a social, enter in a relationship. This one is associated with, a, I have a list as well. So I can take a look at that list, or I can let the autocomplete help me out for me. So I'll, I'll just type in S for son for that. I have uh, this field right here that says MO, and this is really where the bottom of the program is going to start helping you out when it comes to completing this return. Uh, if I take a look down here, it says number of months that the, that the dependent lived with a taxpayer, or I could also enter in CN if the dependent was a Canadian resident or MX from Mexico. In this case, I'm going to say that they lived with a taxpayer the full year, so I'll type in 12 months for that. And as you can see, some uh, fields have populated into, into the return automatically for me. And if I wanted to take a look at some of the what this means exactly, I can take a look down here. Uh, number one, it says press F3 for list of dependent codes. Now, F3 is essentially the same thing as clicking on the Choices button. You'll notice when I hover my mouse over Choices, I see a little tooltip that pops up saying F3 in parentheses. That's just my F3 key. So I can press F3 on my keyboard, and now I can see that number one says that, that the dependent lived with the taxpayer. That's all that means. If I need to change it, I can, but I'll just leave that as is and move it to the next field that we have here. E says, is, says that all the information I've entered so far, that this dependent is eligible for EIC. That's what that E represents. But again, if I need to make a change, I can, if the taxpayer, or excuse me, if the dependent is older, uh, I can say that they're a student if that's the case, disabled, whatever the case may be, you can use these letters to modify uh, that code. And then the next one that we have here, X, it says uh, this X represents that, yes, they are eligible for the child tax credit as well. Using the info I've entered so far, it looks like it's pretty good when it comes to that. Now, the next field, this one did not populate automatically. And if I take a look down here, it says that it says Form 2441, Dependent Care. And I can mark this with an X, or I can enter a D for Disabled. What this is, essentially, is a shortcut to add the 2441 uh, when it comes to dependent care. So if I, you know, since we're entering dependent information at this point, we thought it'd be kind of natural to ask the taxpayer if this dependent that we're entering at this point had any dependent care. If they did, I can mark this with an X. Oops, mark this with an X. Oh, I see, it's not allowing me because the dependent is it's just a bit too old. Let me modify that uh, age a bit. There we are. Now, if I mark it with an X, it will add the 2441 for, for me if I move away from this screen or if I simply refresh. This refresh button kind of takes into consideration everything I've entered so far. Um, so if I do that, there's 2441 for me. So again, just think of this as a shortcut to add the form. Normally, you would add forms by going to the Add Form button here on the toolbar. This is where you can see a list of all the forms you can possibly add, uh, add to this tax return, including the 2441. But uh, since we're here, this is another way you can do so. 
And then finally, this last field that we see, that we see here, just to wrap up this dependent, uh, this is very specific. It has to do with the Idaho Grocery Credit or the Illinois, the ICR Education Credit. So uh, if you are from Idaho or if you prepare returns for Idaho or Illinois, um, you may be familiar with, these, with, with this grocery credit or this educational credit, and that's what this field is, is for, to enter those, uh, those qualifying months there in the case of the uh, grocery credit. Or enter in 31. <laughs> you would type in 31 to enter to, a trans to uh, have that associated with the uh, ICR educational credit. So now that we've entered at least one dependent, uh, what I'll do at this point, you know, we filled out the basics of this client data screen. And the importance of this, you know, why we, we would want to do this is because all of the information that we've entered here would transfer into the forms that we add later on to the return. That's really the main benefit. Otherwise, you know, if you don't do this, you'd have to be typing in this information for every single form. By typing it once in here, the majority of the, the information would pull into any forms that you later on add to this tax return. And that's what we're going to be doing right now. We're going to start adding forms to this return. And the first form I want to add is a, some sort of income form a W-2, for example. So I'll do that. I'll add, I'll click on my Add Form button here, and notice that the program is right away going to take me to the W-2. That's why it's highlighted in blue. And that's because that's, it's the most commonly added form to the return. From here, I can double click, and there we are. And see how this information is being populated already? This is all pulling from the client data. Now, what hasn't pulled over, what I need to complete, are the areas that have to do with the employer and the wages. So I'll do that now. You could either enter this information manually or if you have a, if you serve a very specific type of clientele, you know, if you um, help people out that typically work at the same business or uh, work at the same, by the, from the same employer, uh, this is a, another dynamic database. So once you enter in a new employer, with their EIN, it's going to be saved automatically into the database. So you can just choose one of these, and there we are. The information will be filled out the way it needs to be. Now, as far as the wage information goes, I'll enter in something in here. Let's say 25k for now, and I'll enter in a withholding of let's say $3,000. There we are. If I had any retirement information, I could enter this information here. Uh, you know, this particular form, we try to make it seem like the paper form as much as possible to help you fill this out. So you essentially just want to copy whatever you're looking at when it comes to the W-2. Um, and at this point, what I'll do is I'll uh, go to my, oh, I wanted to demonstrate. I've entered some wages in here, um, but I don't see a refund amount just yet. It says federal zero due. This error here will display a refund amount at all times, but I just simply have to refresh the page or move away from this form. If I refresh, now we're starting to see some stuff in here. We're, start, we're starting to see a refund so far. This is using the information I've entered so far. And um, you'll notice some other forms have been added automatically. We see the 8867. That's because I have a dependent and um, I have some wages that fall, that fit into that uh, into the regulations when it comes to EIC. I don't have it added to the return just yet, and that's because I have to complete um, the 8867. I have to fill that out before the credit pops in, and we'll take a look at that here in a bit when we go into verify. But before I, before we get into that, let's say that this taxpayer uh, is pretty much you're wrapping it up, you know. You have wages in here. You have the basics when it comes to the dependent to, and the uh, taxpayer. At this point, you want to start talking about how this taxpayer is going to get this refund. Well, that's on the 8879. If I double click on this 8879, at the very top, you can select how the taxpayer is actually going to be getting this refund. Whether or not it's a check from the IRS, or a direct deposit from the IRS, or if it's a bank product, which is number five. You want to make sure if they are going to be using a bank product for, this, for their refund, you'll enter in number five in here, 
And then if I refresh, or if you refresh later on, what would happen is the bank app would be added to the return automatically. In my case, um, and actually in, in, all, in all of your cases at this point, you can't add the bank application. It's just too early in the season. Later on, um, uh, around the beginning of January, January 8th is what I've heard so far, one final step in order for you to get the bank approval into the program would be to go to the website, to crosslinktax.com, and do a bank uh, confirmation. It's to essentially confirm what bank you'll be using when it comes to those bank products. So keep that in mind. You know, as this tax season comes closer around the 8th of January, all of you that have, have, that have applied with a bank so far and that have gotten approval from their respective banks, there will, there will be one final step that you have to do on the website, and that is to confirm what bank you're using. There's going to be a, a bank uh, selection option under the Office Management tab. Um, well, you'll have to do that. And that is when the approval will be sent to the program and when you'll actually start being able to use that bank app form that appears here. But for the sake of this, for the sake of this demonstration, what I'll do is I'll enter in a check from the IRS. Um, and that way I can, you know, move forward with this return. Now, something I should mention as well, California, this, this isn't released just yet. So what I'll do at this point is I'll delete this uh, form. I'll delete this state return. Um, to do so, I can right click and I'll have the option. That's how you would delete any form in the return. Let's say I want to get rid of this 2441. I can right click, remove form. It'll ask me to confirm and there we are. I can do the same thing with any states. Right click, remove state and there we are, it's gone. Now, if you need to add a state, let me show you that real quick. That's in the add form as well. But when we're under this federal, when we click on add form, we're just looking at all the federal forms at this point, all the federal forms you can attach to the return. Um, and you can scroll with your mouse, just like I'm doing right now, or you can use your keyboard to jump to a specific form. But the states are all found underneath, underneath this state tab. Once I click on state, here's a list that I can click on to view all the states and they're all included in the software. You may not have them just yet because it's just too early, but you can click on the state that you want to add and there are the state forms. Just double click and it'll add itself to the return. Pretty straightforward. But at this point what I'll do is I want to wrap up this return. I, this taxpayer is just getting a regular check. They only have you know one W-2, they have one dependent. It's very simple. At this point, what I'll do is I'll go to my verification process. That's one of the uh, final steps when you're trying to wrap up this return. If I click on verify, what's going to happen is, is that the program is going to show me a list of all the things that I have to fix. Now, thankfully, this process can, even though I, I can see, I have quite a few of errors that I have to fix. A lot of them on, are on the 8867. What I'll do is I'll use what we call our point and, uh, and shoot error resolution to go through this. And it'll be a, quite a simple process because once you click on verify, the program goes into this verification mode basically. And now if I double click, it takes me to the error. It takes me to where I need to go to make, to cor make the correction. As you can see, I'm in this little field here. And then down below, it's telling me what's going on. It says I have to enter a D for a driver's license or an S for a state license. So I'll say that this is a driver's license. I'll press D. But when I press on enter, notice what happens. It opens up the other error that I have next on my list. So again, once you're kind of like in this verification mode, the program is going to want to guide you step by step or error by error to clear out all these errors that you have to fix. In the case of this error, it's telling me about protection plus. Do I want to, you know, enroll for Protection Plus for three years? For this, at this, for this example, I'll just choose no to move forward. And again, it's taking me to the next area. This one, this area, this area has to do with um, direct deposit opt out. It's it's a very uh, people tend to be tend to have questions about this one. It's the reason why we're seeing this is because we have we have um, direct deposit information. We have 
um, bank information on the client data, but yet we're still using a check. So that's why the program is like trying to make sure that you're sure that this customer doesn't want to use their direct deposit information. You are opting out. Even though you have it saved on the client data, you're opting out of it. So just keep that in mind. Um, here, it's telling us, hey, we have the 2441 marked, but I deleted that. So I'm just going to get rid of that and then move to my next one, asking me for the prepare type. And notice as I go through these, you know, it's taking me right to where I need to go. All I have to do is enter the information and go to the next error. And some of these are, will be filled out as you can go through them. They'll be filled out um, um, automatically. By entering one thing, it'll fill out the rest of them automatically. Now here I'm stopping because I'm sh we're on, I believe, the EIC checklist. Um, and I wanted to point out that when you verify, the program will take you to where you need to go to make the correction. But in the case of the EIC checklist, it does one better because it takes you to the answer that will provide EIC. So in other words, if EIC, if you want to get EIC for this return and the answer should be yes, the program will take you to the yes box. If the answer should be no, it'll take you to the no box. Now naturally you still want to confirm this information, but I'm just pointing that out to you just so that you can be aware that the verification will help you, at least will take you to the area, to the, an to the answer that you need to answer in order to get that EIC, in order to get that credit. But of course, you know, uh, you do want to follow IRS regulations. You want to do your due diligence and answer these and ask these questions of the taxpayer and of yourself. But um, but at least it takes you to where you need to go to make that selection real quick. Once you do confirm that, and go to the next one. Now, for the cases of this demonstration, I'm just going to show you how easily I can go through this. And that's because you know we're on a webinar here and we've got to get through this. But naturally you want to um, go through this uh, one at a time and make sure that you're answering correctly. And once you complete the verification, click on verify again, and it'll go through another verification process. Um, here, it's asking me for my preparer information. And this, you can configure the program to, uh, and I'll just get, I'll clear out these errors as we go through it, um, as I talk through this. You can go through this one at a time. There we are. And one last thing. I'll get rid of that one. And I'll choose school records for this particular verification method. And now we're really wrapping up. There we are. Now if we verify again, that's what you want to see. And if there aren't any more errors, and you're now ready to print and transmit. So let's go through that right now. Once I clear out all the errors, I'll click on print. And here are my options that I have when it comes to printing the return. I can print the return directly from here. But other than that, I can capture the taxpayer's signature using a electronic signature pad using this sign doc button. I could also capture the taxpayer's signature remotely if I want to use um, their, the taxpayer's smartphone as a way to capture their signature. This is a great tool for that. Even if the taxpayer or spouse isn't at the office, you can click on, that's why it's called remote sign, because you can, you click on this button and it sends the taxpayer or the spouse a link essentially on their phone where they can review the return and sign for that, for that tax return right there on their phone and you'd get that signature populated into the program. Um, you can view a PDF, you can preview this return, or you can even email a copy of this return um, um, if, if you wanted to do that as well. But for now, um, I'll simply click on the print button here. And what I'll do at this point, and assuming that I've captured, that I've configured my program to archive, I should mention that the document archive will keep a copy of all these options that we have, of all the returns that I've printed. It'll keep a copy of that. And um, when it comes to importing any documents as well, keep in mind that the document archive allows you to scan any documents with the handheld scanner or import them. If you have your own scanner, 
you can click on this and import any documents or any files that you want to attach to this document archive and create essentially a paperless office, create a digital filing cabinet for this. But for now, I'm going, I printed it out, it's archived just in case. Um, and at this point, I want to wrap everything up. I want to transmit this return. To do that, I'm going to click on the Q button. Once I click on Q, the program is going to confirm what exactly I'm sending. Uh, if I had any states, they would appear here as, here as well. And I can choose to either you know, send just the federal or send the states as well. I'll click on Q, and the program will close the return automatically for me. And notice a couple of things here. First of all, the status of the return now reads return queued. So at this point, this return is just waiting to be transmitted, waiting to be e-filed. Um, I can create another return and get started with another tax return if I wanted to, uh, or I can go and actually transmit this return right away, which is what I'll do here in a bit. But I also want to point out this little, um, what do we see here, a little lock. That's because I've marked this return for transmission. It's uh, locked the return automatically. So again, you know, there it is. There's the warning message again. If I need to open this return and make any changes to it, you want to make sure to unlock, unlock that return under the return menu like we saw before. But for now, I'm going to transmit this return that is queued. That's just waiting to be transmitted. To do so, I'm going to click on this transmit button on the toolbar. And, the, and if I, there's my 1040 return that's waiting to be transmitted. I could click on this filter button down here to take a look. There's that taxpayer that's just waiting. And if I finally want to e-file that return, if I want to transmit it off, you would click on this button that we see right here. This would send, would communicate with our central site and transmit it off uh, to the IRS and to any states as well. And hopefully, in a few, you'd get an approval back. And you, you of course, would see that information. When you take a look at the status, you would see uh, updates. It has it been acknowledged? Has it been accepted? Has it been rejected? Uh, those are all things that you can confirm with this status menu or even this exceptions and rejects area. When it comes to the rejects specifically, you'll be able to see them accumulate here if you do have any rejects that you have to fix.